Yamamoto Nutrition, proud sponsor of RX Muscle. Visit YamamotoNutrition.com. Welcome back to Live With, brought to you by Yamamoto Nutrition. I'm Dave Palumbo, and tonight's guest is a celebrity on YouTube. His station, You See the Freak, is very well liked, and I've been requested to get him on the show. So here he is today, Dave Crossland. Afternoon. How you doing, Dave? Now, uh, Dave, you have a, a, a pretty popular channel there over there in the UK, and uh, you love to talk about performance-enhancing drugs. And let's face it, our industry is obsessed with them, obsessed with getting knowledge and information about them. So my first question to you to start off is, what is your background uh, as far as educationally speaking, and, and, and how did you get so much knowledge with regard to anabolic steroids? Uh, I have no medical training or pharmacology training whatsoever, so I've just learned as I've gone along. Um, my initial road into steroids, I hadn't got a clue. My first cycle was four years wrong. I just took it that was selling me told was any good. I left the sport for about 12, 13 years. And then uh, when I came back, I noticed that usage has changed massively. Um, doses were a lot higher. People were using a lot more stronger compounds. And then I started to educate myself. And then I started to get into harm reduction stuff and that sort of thing. Um, and then I, I went on two experiments to see how big I could get. Um, uh, my biggest was 415 pounds at six foot one. Whoa. That's great Kovacs uh, territory. I, probably best balance for size, strength, and condition was probably 365. Um, 392 condition wasn't bad considering weight, but at 365, I still look like a bodybuilder. Now, you, I asked you before the show, what do you consider yourself? And you said a fat bodybuilder. But the bottom line is bodybuilders like to compete. Uh, have you ever gotten up on a stage? Uh, I did a little show as a natural when I was 19. <laughs> now, do you ever want to get back on stage? Is that the goal? No. Uh, I've just no interest. Uh, um, I started dieting to compete in the British three years ago. Uh, and as I got more and more into it, I more and more realized that I just didn't want it enough. Right. Well, you, you got a lot of size on you. How big do you want to get? You want? Are you still trying to get bigger at 45 years of age? No, no. Uh, the result of 415 pounds was a pair of knackered kidneys. <laughs> so what happened to the kidneys? So, I sit somewhere between 360 and 380 these days, depending on how the water retention is. Mm -hmm. um, but at the moment, I took quite a bit of time off. And at the moment, I'm going to attempt a 260 kilo behind an egg press in September. Wow. What is that in, in pounds? That's over 500 pounds, obviously. That's about 580. Wow. So you have a lot of strength in addition to being as big as you are. Um, not so much now, but I did have at my peak. Yeah, I've never been particularly strong in the basic list. My bench was 220 kilo, which what? About 500 pounds for five. Squat was 300 kilo for five. Dead was about the same, but I was quite weird in that stuff like bent over rows, I'd do 260 kilo, behind the neck press, I'd rep 220. Um, so I was strong in weird movements as opposed to the traditional three. How come you never try to do any powerlifting or like strongman stuff? You look uh, like a strongman guy to me when I look at you. Uh, <laughs> Maybe it's the beard. Uh, I have a very weak back. Okay. I have a very long torso. And I have short legs, so deadlifting is a difficult movement for me. Gotcha. I understand. Uh, but to be honest, I mean, my drive's always been the training. Um, yeah, I wanted to see how big I could get, uh, but that was a personal journey, really, more than anything else. Um, and then as I got more into it, I thought, you know what? What I decided to do was make every aspect of it live, and that's why I started the channel. So the channel was originally started to track my progress, trying to hit 400 pounds. Right. Um, 
and it grew from there and I started to add more and more content. And the journey resulted in two films being produced, but it was, I didn't, I had no ambition to show anything in any sort of light. It was just a case of showing it exactly as it was. Right. So when it was shit, it was shown as being shit. And when it was good, it was shown as being good. And if I had a crap workout, that's what went on the film, a crap workout. It wasn't, nothing was staged, no weights were set. It just was what it was. That's why people, uh, I think, liked it, because they could relate to it. It was real. Yeah, I, I think I, I got a lot of stick initially. I got a lot of abuse because, obviously, I'm first to admit my condition is not the best. It's never been a strong point for me. Um, and I got a lot of fat drug abuse in this, that, and the other. But as time's gone on and the channel's developed and the content's gone more educational and more information-based, a lot of that's now disappeared. What, um, what did you? Uh, what were you eating when you were trying to gain, get over 400 pounds? Like, what would a typical uh, day be for you? Typical day to me would start with 15 egg whites and 100 oats, 100 grams of oats, followed by 300 grams of either chicken or beef with 100 grams of rice. And that was repeated probably another six to eight times during the day. Post-workout was a 1,500-calorie shake, which was about 80 grams of protein, and the rest was carbs. So that was, you were eating quite a bit of – were you eating 8,000 calories? About 10. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot of food. And you had and no trouble – The bulk of it was solid food. It was very little in the way of fluids. You had no trouble getting that down every day? I had lots of problems getting that down every day. <laughs> that lots of problems. Uh, you know, one of the, the people talk about cheat meals and the rest of it. I didn't want a cheat meal. I just wanted four hours of not eating. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing. When I was trying to get over 300 pounds, and I was over 300 pounds, I would eat sometimes or drink a shake and guzzle it down, and I would actually, if I leaned over too much, I would throw it up. Did that ever happen yep. to you? Oh, I've sat there and you know it's coming and you're trying to relax your throat and you're trying to relax your stomach because you know it's coming and you don't want it to come back up because you know you're going to have to eat it again if it does. That's right. Um, and then you get halfway through a meal or even the last meal, you, you, you stop chewing and it's a mouthful of food and it's a mouthful of water to swill it away. <laughs> you feel your saliva running down your, 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 your cheeks. Oh, it, it's, and you just, you become a robot. You, there's no pleasure in eating, it's just something you do. Right, right. And at the biggest, it was every hour and a half. Wow. Yeah, I, I kind of, I can relate to that, but uh, it's, it's not fun. What, what kind of a drug cycle were you taking when you were uh, trying to get to 400 pounds? <laughs> right, the first stage, which took me in seven months, I went from just over 300 pounds to 365. For that, I went up to three gram of test. Per week? Yes. And one and a half grams of Deca. Of Deca. And a hundred oxy a day. 100. And that was it. That's it. Okay, that's and then. What about growth hormone? Uh, none, none for that. None at all. No insulin. No growth hormone. None of that at all. No peptides. Nothing else for that cycle. But yeah. I did swap the Deca for Tren at one point. Let, let me uh, let me ask you one thing before you go on. Um, a lot of guys complain if they take like 100 milligrams of Deca a week that they can't have sex with their girlfriend. Um, you were taking, you know, 1,200 milligrams a week. Were you having any any issues with that? None. Okay. I never had either, but, you know, I guess it's the, an individual the, the, thing. The main, the main issue I asked on that department was being too damn bloody big. <laughs> um, because my wife is only five foot four. Oh, boy. So it, it made positioning interesting, shall we say? Yeah, you got to really, <laughs> got to really lean your weight on those elbows, huh? <laughs> oh mate, if I if I if I'd have slipped, she'd have been dead. <laughs> <laughs> so all right, so you get to three sixty five. What did it take to get from three sixty five up to four, whatever you were? Right. Well, the plan was when I started the second one was that I felt very much so that I'd overrun on the first one by about six weeks two months so the plan was to run a 16 18 week max right uh and what i found for me when i'm running such high doses i need to taper in so um the second one was a real mess because i started to taper in and then i had a massive back spasm oh. being the dickhead that i am i didn't get it enough time and went back training this resulted in my psoas going into spasm and crushing my femoral nerve Oof. That resulted in me being in a wheelchair. Really? Um, wow. 
Um, I could walk to some degree, but not very far. I struggled to stand up straight and everything else. So initially what I did was I brought the doses back down, but I didn't go off. Then things would improve slightly, but still not massively. And I kept training. This is the daft thing about it all that. I'd, I'd actually crawl up the steps to the gym on my hands and knee. I'd crawl from one machine to the other, then sit on the machine, do the exercise, and crawl off to the next one. <laughs> um, and I, if it, with, with any sense, I should have just come off and dealt with it. I didn't. I kept thinking, it's going to be all right in a couple of weeks. It's going to be all right in a couple of weeks. The weeks turned to months. The months turned to months and months. Eventually, I got to a level where I was reasonably mobile, uh, and the result was I ended up staying on for roughly about 14 months. Wow. Um, at the peak of that, I was running a three-gram test base again. I went up as high as 1.5 grams of trend, but I came back down to one. Um, and then I was running 100 megavan of R. I was running... 26 IU of farmer growth a day at the peak, Ooh. and I was running 55 IU of insulin. Milos would have been proud of you. It was a lot, and it, the thing is, the, the first section, Dr. 365, which was the basis of the first film that I produced, the drugs were a tool. The drugs were a secondary part of the exercise, and the training was the primary thing. Um, then what happened moving into the second film was the drugs became the focus of everything. Right. What was Except the shifted? What was the name of the of the films? Under construction one and under construction two. Okay, gotcha. That was the UC one, UC two. If people see that on yeah. your uh, on your YouTube channel. Now, um, what was the response you got from the people who watched that? Did they like it? Did they not like it? I watched part of it. I thought it was entertaining. I think that the first film, most people found it quite good. There were various criticisms about the training not being, being enough training or there not being enough talk about diet and stuff like that. I, I think people approached it too much to a degree as a bodybuilding film, but they, most people enjoyed the honesty of it. Yeah. Um, the second one, I don't know if you've seen the second one, is a lot darker film. No, I have, I have to watch that still. It's on YouTube, uh, right? Yeah, no, it's not. Oh, uh, well, it okay. shouldn't be. If it is, I'm, I'm ordering a takedown now. Uh, <laughs> but the, the first one, the second one, we go to a body dysmorphia specialist. We talk to him. Uh, we go out to Denmark and look at the really strict laws they have over there regarding steroids and supplements. So we do a little bit more research. We go to a medical center and they test me and go through everything that's going on in my body. And then it attracts me at the end where my kidneys start to struggle and I end up in hospital. And... The, the second film, I mean, it goes through when my mum gets killed halfway through it. It goes through some of the injuries that I had to deal with. And the second film, I don't like watch. I've watched it once and I won't watch it again. Really? Um, wow. So that, that's very, brutal. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, the best way I can describe it is looking back, I can see the mistakes I made. Looking back, I can see how... I became so drug focused and that the food and the diet and the training and everything else became secondary and that's not how it should be. Mm. Uh, and it's just basically like watching 12 months of a fuck up of your life in HD. It's not the most pleasurable experience for me. I'm sure but, people will enjoy the honesty of it though. Well, that, that's the thing. I mean, I have great faith in James Grealish who produced the films and, and obviously filmed them all. And when it came to the editing, he asked me if I wanted to see the master cut. And I just said, no. I said, do it. Get it out there. Because I do trust him implicitly. And he is very good at what he does. And he has a, a certain sensitivity with what he does as well. And it, it is, I suppose, it is a training film. I wouldn't call it a bodybuilding film. I wouldn't call it anything else. But it's got a little bit more than that. It's not just blokes in a gym. Right. You know, it's not just diet and reps and drugs and all that crap. There's, there's more of just me being a person and me existing at those sort of sizes. Right. You know, getting, getting on a plane and taking up two seats because they're not big enough and those sort of things. Are you, uh, how's your health? Generally not bad. I have what's known as FSGS, which is chronic kidney disease. Right. Um, the specialists tell me that it's been brought on by size and lifestyle more than anything else, but I can't help the feel that the drugs have played a role. Um, when I was diagnosed two years ago, 
they actually said that I'd had the condition for about 10 years, which is probably why I never did very well with dieting because I always had a lot of water retention that I never realized what it was. Right. When I would admit to hospital, I dropped 65 pounds in five days. Wow. Sure. Sure was water. water. Um, and that's when it made me realize as well that despite all the drugs in UC2, the fact that I wasn't pushing enough food in and the fact that I wasn't training very hard, I'd actually made very little progress whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Um, but uh, they said five years. That was two years ago. And my readings are still the same as they were. When I initially got um, went into hospital, I think I was sitting about 22 on EFGR. Um, it then came back up to mid-40s, and it stayed roughly around the 40 region ever since. It has ups and downs. I have good periods and bad periods, depending on what's going on in my life. Uh, but in general, the average is now about the same. So it's not deteriorated any either. What's your, what's your creatinine level? Oh, I couldn't tell you. Uh, That's usually the, you know, what they use for... Six, 600 and odd, maybe? Uh, I don't know. I don't think so. Maybe you guys use different units than we do here. Usually it's around one point something, you know, uh, the mass. Oh, right, yeah. It'll be different. It's different units. But, yeah. it, I mean, it was. It used to always, it, it was never, even now, it, it, it's high, but considering my size and everything else, it's not ridiculously high. Now, do you ever say to yourself, man, I should probably lose some weight because uh, that might take the strain off my organs a little bit at this point, now that you've kind of done the movie already and you've gotten out of Well, I am slowly but surely. I mean, this is the stupid thing. I, I am not training for any size, which is why I picked a strength sort of goal. Yeah. Uh, I'm not particularly bothered about size as much anymore. I've been there, done that, got the T-shirt, and, you know, it's definitely that box is very well and truly ticked. Um... So I don't eat massive amounts. Yeah. Some days I don't even eat at all. Mm. Uh, my diet isn't brilliant. It's average. It goes up and down. Uh, it could be better. Um, but I'm not, I've been clean for 18 months. Um, and I'm not really doing anything to maintain size. I probably only train three, uh, push four days a week now. Right. right. Um, mm. I just seem to be sat here. It doesn't seem to make much difference. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you what do you feel is a uh, is a good dose for people who are trying to grow, like to take as far as testosterone goes and the anabolic? I, I, I think it's very much down to the individual. Um, I mean, the, the 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 big problem is that if you start looking at if you start asking questions like, what more drugs can I take? Instead of saying right, how can I train harder? Or how can I train more intensely? Then I think you're starting to have to ask yourself questions about are you looking at this the right way? Right, right. Having said that, you know, dosage is based on experience uh, and, and how long you've been using and how far, how far developed you are within what you do. I mean, if your diet and training is pretty much on the point, then, and you've been training a good 10 years and been using a good seven, eight years, then. You know, when you start getting over three gram, you start seeing some real changes. So you you believe you have to take that much uh, testosterone to get the uh, results? No, not at all. Not at all. I, I I think most people with efficient diet and efficient training would probably be sitting about 1.5 to 2 grams in total. Mm, right. Okay. That, that but the truth reasonable. remains that when you go over three, there are some serious changes start to occur. Yeah. Well, sometimes the changes are not positive either. They could be negative. No, no, not at all. I mean, the one thing I have had is, is all right, apart from my kidney issue, but in general, my heart's great. No issue with my heart, no issue with my liver. I've had them all checked out extensively. Uh, and the kidneys is the only thing that suffered. And, and they're telling me it's more a body mass issue than anything else. I do think the drugs have to have played a role. I think, it, I think it's blood pressure. To me, blood pressure is what just what really damages the kidneys. And I think I've seen a lot of bodybuilders who have some, you know, not everyone's in kidney failure, but there's guys who have some kidney issues. And I think it's because it was undiagnosed blood pressure. I mean, when you weigh 300 pounds, you know, your blood pressure is going to be high. There's no way about it. But my blood, my blood pressure of 365 pounds was 124 over 67. Oh, really? Wow. Well, so, so much for that theory. <laughs> that, was the, that was the strange thing. My blood pressure's never been, my blood pressure spikes when I train. Right. But my resting blood pressure has always been pretty good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, they put me on blood pressure meds. Yeah. Obviously, that was the first thing they were thinking. They put me on blood pressure meds. It didn't change a thing. Yeah. 
Um, I've always been quite drug resistant, um, and I tolerated the high doses quite well. I mean, when you think I was on in excess of three grams of total drugs for a period of over 12 months. Right. Uh, and I suffered very little real side apart from one majorly bad bout of facial rosacea, which wasn't actually down to the normal drug mechanisms. That was down to severe CNS and adrenal fatigue. Um, my central nervous system was shot to pieces. And as a result, I had a, a real stress reaction of severe adult rosacea on my face. My face looked like a bloody hamburger. <laughs> yeah, that's not fun. We don't like that happening. It, it was what? just massive lumps everywhere. Wow. Um, I came off the drugs. It made no difference whatsoever. Oh, yeah. it, it took quite a while for things to straighten out with everything else. And, and when I went for the test, and the one thing they did say to me was my central nervous system was shot to pieces. Yeah. No. When you, you know, look, we look. I've I've caused damage to my body. I'm sure over the years, and I've had my share of like weird things happen. But um, when you look back and you see the damage that you've you know done to yourself, all the kooky things that have popped up because of your body weight, because of the training, um, do you ever regret it? Do you have any regrets? You know, I've been asked this question before, and I can't honestly give an answer because if I hadn't done it. I would have always have said, what if? And at the same time, if I hadn't done it, I wouldn't be sat here talking to you now. I wouldn't be running a harm reduction business. I wouldn't be helping people stopping themselves from fucking themselves up using too many drugs or doing the wrong things at the wrong time. Right. So would I like my kidneys to be normal? Yeah, of course I would. Well, I wouldn't. You know, I'm not an idiot. But my journey brought me here and I quite like here and I quite like me and I quite like what I do and I don't know if I'd be here if I hadn't taken that journey in the first place. Right. The second thing is it would appear that my kidneys have had some problems for a very long period of time. Now when I gave up training uh, at 20, I think it was 24, I tore my pec off. That was my first major injury. And I stopped training for about 12, 13 years. Now, during that time, I was a 400-pound fat mess. All sorts of problems going on with personal life, all sorts of issues, depression, God knows what else. Now, there is as much chance that that period of my life being a fat mess was what actually triggered the kidney damage and started the process. True. You're right. That's true. Um, but obviously, lifestyle sins hadn't helped. Uh, the unfortunate thing is, before I went on to UC2, I spent quite a lot of time visiting my local doctor, insistently asking about my kidney function because the results were coming back below range. And he was kept saying to me, that no, that's what's normal for you. That's what's normal for you. Now, if I'd have known what I know now, which is the fact that my kidneys were knackered, I probably would never have attempted UC2. Right. But I didn't. I went forward. I'm a great believer in karma and fate and one thing for a reason. Uh, and you know what? If the cost of my kidneys or me having problems for a period of time with my kidneys means that I can help people stop from messing themselves up, then to me it's worth it. Right. I agree. I mean, I, I see where you're coming from. You know, uh, obviously we all have our own journey and we have our own, you know, place to go. I could have gone and become a doctor. I was in medical school and I chose to be a bodybuilder and that's uh, all there is to it and I don't regret it. Now, talk to me a little bit about uh, what do you th what do you think of some of these crazy uh, doses of growth hormone that people are doing nowadays? Twenty IU's a day, you know, eighteen IU's a day. Do you think it's uh, overkill? Yes, very much so. Having been at those doses, I had nothing. I had nothing really good to, to, to claim from it, to be quite honest. Yeah, you think it's just um, they're wasting their money. In other words. I, I, I do, and I even if even if finances permitted, and even if health permitted, I don't think I'd use growth again unless I used it as a very very low dose as regards to an anti-aging type property and you you know that sort of element of it. Um, I don't really. I think for money versus results, you can get more out of a solid course of gear and busting your ass in the gym and busting your ass in the kitchen than you can by sitting there and throwing IGF and insulin and growth and everything else at you. Right, I agree with you. Uh, what about... What full you... of a house when I was using it, pumps beyond belief when I was using it, but as soon as I came off it, it all just sort of melted away. 
Yeah. What, what do you think about, like, I don't know if you've been following uh, our programming. When I had Milo Sarshev on, uh, he, had a, he has his, uh, his insulin protocol where it's, he believes in, like, 40 or 80 IUs of insulin per day. What do you, what do you think about that? Where do you think I got my insulin protocol from? <laughs> Milos gave it. Sounded Milosian. Milosian, it sounded. What hey, do you think Milos, about it? Is it crazy? Guy, but when I started messaging him with problems, he didn't have a clue. He didn't know what to do. <laughs> uh, Milos's answer to me, to the insulin, is when you start getting desensitized, instead of dealing with the desensitization, he just whacks more in to compensate for it. <laughs> And what do you believe? What do you think about that? Well, it works to a degree, but I do think you end up putting unnecessary weight on, which, when comes contest time, doesn't actually make that massive an impact on your overall stage weight. I know a few guys that have run with him that were the biggest they've ever been off season and actually looked in reasonable condition. And then when they came down to stage weight, yeah, they were a few pounds heavier. But they had a hard time getting down. They suffered massively in the off-season for the excess weight. And the end result wasn't that dramatic on stage. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think it's a lot uh, of water. Don't get me wrong. In the off-season, they looked incredible. Because they still held, they, they appeared to still hold a reasonable amount of condition. But there's so much inter of water yeah. that when they actually died down and came back to normal levels, because they weren't running such ridiculous doses of the drugs, it all just disappeared. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you, 100%. I mean, I played around with sodium loading at one point, and, and I literally, and I'm not exaggerating here, all right, the amounts is probably an estimation, but I, I literally shifted about 25 pounds of water, sub-Q, you know, edema, into my muscles. And I only stayed there for a day and a half. But for a day and a half, I was huge. Right. I mean, it, it pushed my arms to the 26 and a half inch. <laughs> yeah, what, water will do that for sure. Try try rebounding after a bodybuilding show. You'll see you can gain 40 pounds in three days. Uh, Dave, right. Got it in the muscle for it. I only, could only hold it there for a couple of days because the amount of loading I had to do to do it. But it was there for long enough, you know, and it was like, mm hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, um, what is the, what, first of all, when is the, the second movie coming out? Is it, is it available for people to watch someplace? Is it going to be broadcast? What's the deal with that? It's been out. Uh, we sell everything from our website, which is www.underconstructionoffilm.com. And it's been out probably 12 months now. Okay. How do people we, watch it? Uh, you can either download it or a digital download, digital stream, or you can order the DVD. Okay. Is, does it cost any money to download it from the website? Yes, it does. It's uh, £9.99. Okay, so that's not bad. Well, I think it's about $12, $11 exchange yeah. rate now. Yeah, exchange yeah. not very good. All right. And, and what's the website again for that? www.underconstructionthefilm.com. Okay, great. I'm going to have to check that out. Um, also, Dave, um, what does the future hold for you? Where, where do you see yourself going now? Because I know you're, you seem like a very goal-oriented person, like you have to set a goal for yourself and then go after. What's the, what's the next? I know you said you're going to try to press behind the neck all that weight, but what's next after that? Like, where do you see yourself in like, the next couple of years? Well, the main thing, I'm, I run a company called Crossland's Harm Reduction Services. Um, I deal with all aspects of drug education, but obviously I specialize in, in performance and image enhancing drugs, which is primarily steroids, obviously. Mm. Um, in that role, um, I currently do awareness presentations to the military, for the UK military, um, and I've done, I do some training and work for the police, both from... Um, an advisory point of view of what these drugs are and how they work, but also from a point of view of education for police officers from the point of view of them using. Gotcha. Um, the, the police force have, uh, unfortunately, quite an ambiguous drug policy that is not very clear about the rules and regulations for these guys, so a lot of them fall foul. Mm. Obviously, we have the unique condition in the UK where steroids are not illegal if you're using them or possessing them for personal use. It's only the sale or the importation that's illegal. Oh, that's good. I didn't even know that. that that's cool. Yeah, so it, it makes it a grey area for a lot of industries because obviously employers don't don't agree for whatever reason, um, but then they're not acting on a criminal situation, so a lot of people are confused about how that works in employment policy. Exactly. Uh, now, the other thing I've just started getting into is going into schools 
um, and this isn't really so much drug education. Um, a friend, my training partner, um, is quite a successful businessman, and he is friends with a gentleman called David Thomas, who is a world memory champion, but he's also a motivational speaker. And he's been trying to get me into doing this sort of stuff. So what I'm doing at the moment, because I've had quite a colourful life, shall we say. Like a lot of big guys, I've spent time on the door, spent time in the security industry. I did four and a half years in prison. So I've been around the block a little bit. What were you in prison and, for, Dave? Uh, <laughs> receipt of stolen vehicles and tax evasion. Oh, boy. Don't cheat the government uh, out of their money. You should know better than that. It, yeah, long story short, they wanted me for something and that's all they could get on me. Um, but it's like next month I'm going into a, a school in Liverpool that has a real gang culture problem. Right. And I'm going to talk to them about my life, my prison life, the, the violence that's been in my life, the crime that's been in my life, uh, and where I've gone through, what it's cost me and where I am today. Now... What helps me in all that is I'm six foot one, I'm 360 pounds, I've got a shaved head, a big beard, and I'm covered in tattoos. <laughs> so obviously, I have a visual impact. Yeah. And so I've started doing a little bit. I'm going over to a school in Bradford in a couple of weeks, which basically is a school full of kids that can't go to any other school. Right. So I'm starting to do stuff like that a bit more. Um, I still want to make a decent living. I mean, I still got bills to pay and I still like a nice house and I still like to drive a fancy car when I can afford one. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, I also want some a little bit more back from what I do. Um, and I find this sort of help support stuff really, really rewarding. So if I can manage to combine the two, great. And obviously I'll continue to try and build my channel and educate people and try and keep people safe. At the end of the day... I think, particularly with certain drugs and trend being the big one, I think we're in for a scary time in about five years' time. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, and it's like, you know, I've been there. I've done the high doses. I know how it feels. I know how it feels to be hanging out your ass. I also know how it feels to weigh 400 pounds. And trust me, it isn't fucking nice. It is no quality of life. <laughs> in fact, it is fucking shit. <laughs> uh, and it's like, you know, I like to think that I'm quite a dealer in truth. Um, I've tried to be very open and very honest about what I've done. And I've always tried to answer questions that people post to me as honestly as possible, even if they are embarrassing. Yeah. But I think the only way you're going to get people's attention and teach people is to be honest. Oh, 100%. These drugs, they work. But like everything in life, that famous economic saying, there are no free meals. The more these drugs work, the more effective these drugs are, the bigger the payoff you've got in damage to you. And it's as simple as that. And, you know, you've got to manage the risk and manage the rewards and base them on your opportunities and what you want to try and achieve and, and look at this with a, a whole aspect on your life. I had a guy message me today. His relationship's gone to shit. His love, the love of his life is absolutely decimated, uh, decimated by it all because he took shitloads of trend and was an asshole. Yeah. It's and I get these on a daily basis, quite high level on a daily basis of guys from various cultures and backgrounds that have literally messed their lives up. And then people are on there saying, oh, these drugs don't cause no harm. Well, what well, well, they do? That doesn't mean that they're going to cause harm to everybody. But you, if you are aware of what they do, you're aware of how they work, then you can manage these things. And if you start seeing the signs that things are going wrong, you know to do something about it. The, I'm right in at the moment to the effect on neurosteroids and um, neurochemicals. And I'm seeing more and more at the moment about quite severe personality changes and, and quite severe long-term anxiety and depression issues within ex-users. Now, whether that's drug-based or perception-based, as in body image-based, I don't know. I'm still looking into things. But, and, but and Dave, I think there's some, definitely something going on. Some people have problems to begin with, and they compensate by taking the steroids, and then when they're on them, they feel great, and then when they actually have to stop taking them 10 years down the road, they still got the same mental problems that they never addressed. And I think that's In most cases, problem. it would appear that those problems are actually being exaggerated. Yeah, exactly. Well, Dave... I never really had a massive body image issue. I was aware 
but I didn't have to the point where it would affect my behavior right. before I started taking steroids. Mm. There have been points where my body image issues have affected my behavior since I took steroids. They seem to increase the issue. Mm. Well, I think that's the case with everything. We, as bodybuilders, we never feel we're big enough. We never feel we're good enough. And, you know, you can never get to the point of being good enough or big enough. And that's the bottom line. And there's only one Mr. Olympia out there. Uh, and so everyone else is, is inadequate, in, es in essence. And you have to learn to live with your inadequacies. And you have to learn to live with the fact that you're not the best out there. And you have to just find a niche for yourself. And I think you found a really good niche for yourself. I think you're going to help a lot of people out there. I think your channel is doing good now. And I think that the movies are, are very intriguing and interesting because you were so forthright and open about them. And I want to thank you for taking time uh, out of your schedule and coming on our show. And maybe we can get you on for some, uh, some iron debates in the, in the future when, we do, uh, when I get Milos on to talk about drugs. Yeah, no problem. Happy to be here. All right, cool. Dave, uh, the channel is the You See the Freak. Check it out. It's his YouTube channel. Very honest. A lot of information on there. You can get lost in the channel. It's a, it's a terrific resource. And I want to just thank uh, Dave for coming on the show. For now, we're out of time. Uh, we're done with another episode of Live With, brought to you by Yamamoto Nutrition. I'm Dave Palumbo, and we'll see you next time.